name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, family, so here we are today. We are actually concluding a teaching series that I never intended on teaching. We're concluding a teaching series that I never had any intentions of doing. But yet the Lord, through a series of different events, led me to this thing. And I don't know about you, but I've gotten a lot out of what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And I pray that you have too. See, we as a church over the last month or so, we've been running hard after God. We've been pursuing God. And we're pursuing God because, again, he is God. And in him do we move and breathe and have our very being. And so over the last, again, 30 days or so, many of us has been fasting and praying and seeking after God. Fasting and praying and, and seeking God's face. Also, many of us have been reading a book, a book called Draw the Circle, a 90-day prayer challenge. If you have not picked up this book, please pick up this book. I'm telling you, it will change your life. It will help you in your spiritual walk. We have a few out front. Also, what we're going to be doing is over the next couple of weeks or whatever, we're going to be starting a book review. Everybody that's been reading the book, we want to get together and discuss some of the dynamics that we've been reading in the book. So a couple of weeks, again, we're exactly, uh, we'll announce the date. But again, join in with us because, again, this is how we stir each other on. The Bible tells us this. Now write this scripture now. In the book of Psalms, Psalms 42, and verse 1, it says, As the deer pants... For streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. And again, that's the way a lot of us has been feeling. We've just been panting and, and running hard after God. And one of the cool things about the Lord is this. The Lord says, when you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you. That is a promise of the Lord. Not you might find me, not that I might show up, but he says, when you seek me with all of your heart. And one of the ways that we seek the Lord with all of our heart is by fasting and praying. And when you fasting and praying, what that means is you're denying yourself something, something that's important to you. You say, man, I really want this, but you know what? I'm going to take this and I'm going to put this on the altar of sacrifice. Might be one of my favorites. Cracker Barrel Pancakes. Shh. I thought IHOP had it going on. Time with the Cracker Barrel and got them pancakes. And now my soul says, we want pancakes. But when you sacrifice things that your flesh desires for the Lord, then the Lord says, my, now, look at you. Is seeking. And so again, we've been fasting and, and praying and seeking after the Lord. Now, even though we are officially coming to the end of our corporate fasting and praying, there should always be individual fasting and praying. We should always be seeking after the Lord. And so again, over the last uh, 30 days, we've been doing this teaching series again, a passionate pursuit, a passionate pursuit. In our first study, we talked about how that when we, the people of God, gather together, we should be celebrating. When we gather together in the name of Jesus, man, it should be a celebration. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms there, it says that we are to enter his gates with praise and his courts with thanksgiving. Why? We praise him because of who he is. And we thank him for all that he has done. In that second study, we talked about how that, man, prayer. Prayer is the avenue into the presence of God. And therefore, all of us should pray. We should always pray and never give up. The third study, we talked about how that, the more we pray, the more time we spend in the presence of God, the more we become like God. 
The more time we spend in the presence of God, the more we begin to reflect the glory of God. In today's study, we're going to talk about how that the glory of God is reflected in our lives when the things that are important to God, when the things that are important to Jesus also become important to us. And so with those things in mind, let's go ahead and begin reading. Let's begin reading in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to start right there in verse 12. In verse 12 it says, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. To fulfill, if you have your, body, your Bibles, please go ahead and underline that word, to fulfill. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, stop right there, if you will, and quickly turn over to Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, let's begin reading right there in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, after John was put in prison... Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Stop right there, if you will. Both of those passages of Scripture says the same thing, but one adds a little detail that the other one didn't give. And that's why I always tell you, I always encourage you to read the Bible, to read the whole Bible. Don't just skip from here to there. Because when you read the whole thing, what happens is you get better understanding. And the thing is this, when we take that understanding that we have and we apply it to our lives, then our lives become better. It's not rocket science. I love the fact that the Bible is so simple. The Lord says, do this and watch this. Do this and watch this. Some of you know the passage of Scripture. Where the children of Israel were going into the promised land. And Moses says, I lay before you this day life and death. Life and death. He said, life if you do this and death if you do that. It's not rocket science. And so again, when we understand the Bible, when we take what we read in the Bible, in the totality of the Bible, then our lives become blessed. In this passage of Scripture, again, we see basically the same thing, but a few things that are a little different. When we take what we see here, and again, we add these things to our lives, then we find fulfillment in our lives. Because what we're looking at here is this. We're looking at Again, things that God has called for us to do within our lives. And when we fulfill the things that God has called for us to do in our lives, we have blessed lives. Now, in case you don't know it or not, but God has called you to good works. Before you were even born, God called you to good works. There were certain things that God called for you to do. Listen to this scripture. It's found in the book of Ephesus, Ephesians, I'm sorry, in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before you were born, God says, I got a job for you. I got something for you to do. And so again, when we do those things which God has called for us to do, again, our lives become blessed. That's how we find fulfillment in life. There's so many people who are walking around miserable. There's so many people who are upset and troubled 
and just feel unsatisfied. And why? Because they're not walking in that which God had called for them to walk in. They're thinking and they're listening to the lie of the world that says, well, man, if you just have this, if you have this kind of house, if you have this kind of car, if you have the new Jordans, oh, man, if you got the new Jordans, boy, you popping, you have to, that's all you need is some new this or some new that. And we run it after all of these things, thinking that we're going to find satisfaction in those things when real satisfaction is found in doing what God has ordained for you to do. Are you listening? If you're listening, say amen. amen. Okay. So again, in the passage of scripture that we read here today, there are three things, three very important things. In what we're looking at here, what we read already, we're going to see three things that were very important to Jesus, and they also should be important to us. And they are, number one, the number one thing that was important to Jesus was to bring glory to the Father. To bring glory to the Father. More than anything else, Jesus wanted to bring glory to the Father. Listen to the words of Jesus as found in John's Gospel. In John chapter 12 and verse 49, Jesus says, For I do not speak of my own accord, but... The Father has sent me, commanded me what to say and how to say it. Listen to that. Jesus says, again, I don't speak of my own accord, but I speak what the Father commanded me to say and how to say it. And see, that's important. See, because as you and I both know, it's not always about what you say. It's about how you say it. Amen. And all the married people know that for sure. It's not about what you say, but it's also how you say it. There's many of your husbands, some probably sitting next to their wife right now, and she mad, he going, what? What? What did I say? No, it ain't what you said. It's how you say it. And he's going, I don't know that I don't know what I said. I don't know how I said it, so you're going to have to help me out, sister. And so... It was very, very important to Jesus to say and do according to the Father's will. That was one of the things, again, that really, really blessed Jesus. And Jesus was blessed by glorifying the Father. And the way Jesus glorified the Father was by fulfilling everything that the Father had said for him to do. We see that in the fact where it says here that uh, when John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. You have some people who think, you got some people who believe that Jesus left and went to Galilee because he was hiding out. He was running away. Oh man, John the Baptist then got arrested. John the Baptist is in prison. And so, man, maybe I better bounce. Maybe I better get out of town. Maybe I better run away because, man, I don't want to get caught up in all this drama. They mad at John. If they mad at John and John is validating me, they're going to be mad at me too. So I better cut. No. That's not why he left. Why he left was this. He knew that it was officially time for him to begin his preaching ministry. The reason why he left again, because he knew that it was officially time to start his preaching ministry. Remember, some of you know this, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was to prepare the way for Jesus. And so when John's ministry came to ancient, to an end, and we know that it came to an end because he's in prison, and if you know your Bible, you know he never got out of prison. He was beheaded. So John's ministry was coming to an end. And so Jesus says, John's ministry is over. It's now time for mine to start. And so he went to Galilee 
Why? To fulfill what the prophet said. And what did the prophet Isaiah say? We read it. The prophet Isaiah said that Galilee was going to be the first place to hear the gospel of God. Galilee was going to be the first place to hear the gospel of God, the good news of God's kingdom. And so again, in everything that Jesus did, he was determined to bring glory to the Father. And so that was important to him. And guess what? That should also be important to us. Listen to this scripture, if you will. Write this down. John chapter 30, I'm sorry, John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, in verse 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And so in everything that Jesus did, he was trying to bring glory to the Father. And guess what? God tells us it should be the same way with us. For he tells us, and some of you know this scripture, do it all as unto the Lord. Do it all as unto the Lord. When you do it all as unto the Lord, then you're glorifying God. When you're sitting there and you're dealing with your husband, and the Bible says, show honor, show respect. And you respect your husband, even though you don't feel like doing it, you're doing it all to the glory of God. You're giving God glory in that. And that husband, when, when you, it's time to love on that wife, and you don't feel like loving on her, but you do it anyhow, you're doing it as unto the Lord. You're glorifying the Lord when you're on that job. Yeah, that job. And that boss of yours, that continuously, consistently, constantly gets on your last little nerve. And you're sitting there going, man, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. They need me to do this to get this project through. And if I just drop the ball, the whole project going to fall. And boss man going to look bad. Yeah, uh-huh, who don't know who you think you're dealing with. I got you. But instead of you doing that, you do your best to get this project done. You're doing it as unto the Lord. You're glorifying God. And so again, the number one thing again that was important to Jesus was to glorify the Father. And if that was important to Jesus, that also should be important to us. And I pray that it is. As we say, when we come here, again, something should be happening. Something should be going on in our hearts. Something should be going on in our spirit. Every time we come here, as I told you last week, every time we come here, we have the opportunity to be transformed a little bit more into the image of Jesus Christ. A little bit more. But we have to say yes and amen. See, because just as I was talking about that job, maybe you're here today and you're in that situation and you're going, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but it ain't happening. It ain't happening. So you're just stopping, you're slowing down your own transformation. And so every time we come here, we have the opportunity to be changed a little bit more into the image of Jesus Christ. And the more we are changed to the image of Jesus Christ, the more again we give glory to the Father. Hmm. So the number one thing that was important to Jesus was glorifying the Father. The second thing that was important to Jesus was winning souls for the kingdom. And that should also be important to us. Winning souls for the kingdom of God. Listen to this scripture. Well, we'll go back to what we said in uh, Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus says, The time has come, for the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The kingdom has come. Repent and believe the good news. So it was very, very important for Jesus to Bring souls into the kingdom. Now notice that. Bring souls into the kingdom. 
See, we can't save souls, but we can bring them into the kingdom. Only God can save a soul. Listen to this. If you've been around me in a little time, you've heard this before out of my mouth. Proverbs chapter 11. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, it says this. It says that the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. Again, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. That the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. And so one of our constant prayers should be to the Lord is, Lord, help me to win souls for the kingdom. Lord, help me to win souls for the kingdom. Notice, win souls, not save souls. Only God can save a soul. But you and I can win souls for the kingdom. What about constant prayer should be? Lord, give us wisdom in how to lead them to thy great salvation. How do we lead them there? Many of you know this. The Bible talks about how that there are two roads. There's two roads. There's this long, wide road, and it leads to destruction. It says that many, many people find it in the loss. But then it says there's this narrow road that leads to life, and few find it. So our job as Christians is to help people to find that narrow, Lord, that narrow road. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom how to win people to the kingdom. Jesus said this about us. Jesus says that you are, as a Christian, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Notice, you are. Are. That's definitive. That is a pronouncement. You are. Not you might be or you might possibly become, but you are. If you are a Christian, if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Do you know that what uh, one of the things that light does is light illuminates. Light illuminates. Light shows what's going on. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you were in a place and it was so, 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 so dark. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. There's a place in uh, Tennessee. Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. If you ever go to Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, go. And what they do is they take you and you go in this cave, and you go down about 1,500 feet in the ground, right? And you're inside this mammoth cave, and they got all the lights on. You're sitting there, and you're sitting there, and then they cut the lights off. And I mean, it's so black. It's so dark. It's eerie. You cannot see your own hand in front of your own face. You know it's there, but it's so dark. You can't see it. You are the light of the world. There's a lot of people, a lot of people who are walking in darkness. They're walking in darkness and it's so dark, they don't even know they're walking in darkness. Many of us who have come to the Lord, man, we now see through the light of the gospel, through the light of the scriptures, man, I knew I was bad, but I had no idea I was that bad off. But now that you're getting illuminated through the word of God, you're starting to see, man. And again, as we make those adjustments, life gets better. So there are a lot of people who are around you who's looking for you to show them the way. Also, salt. I don't know if you realize this or not, but salt does a couple of different things. First, salt preserves. It preserves. Before we had refrigeration, they used to take salt and put it in meat. And it would help the meat not to rot. Also, salt makes you thirsty. Ever been to a, a place, you know, where they gave you a lot of salted peanuts while you're waiting for your food or whatever? They 
they weren't giving you those peanuts because they liked you. They were giving you those peanuts to make you thirsty. So while you're waiting for your table, eat them peanuts and keep buying drink after drink after drink after drink. And so we're supposed to make people thirsty for Jesus. And so the question on the floor is this. Are you lighting a path so other people can see Jesus? And is your life making people thirsty for Jesus? I read something the other day in the book that we're reading, the 40-day prayer challenge, and I thought it was just super, super cool. And I want to read it to you right now. Listen to it. It said that if people like what they read in your life, they might want to pick up the book that inspired your translation. I like that. That was cool. Again, if people, if people like what they read in your life, they just might want to pick up the book that inspired your translation. And so again, it was very, very important for Jesus to win souls for the kingdom. And so therefore, it should be important for us to win souls for the kingdom. And again, I love the Bible because the Bible makes it so plain. It makes it so simple. We're going, okay, God, yes, you know, uh, I want to win souls, but how do I do that? It tells us right here. It says by teaching people to repent and believe. Nothing's left to our own imagination. Teach them to repent and believe. That's how we bring people into the kingdom, teaching them to repent. Now, in case you don't know what the word repent means, the word repent actually means to have a change of course. A change of course, a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of course. See, there's one thing. Sometimes people think that confession and repentance is the same thing. It's not. It's not. Confession is confessing that this thing that I'm doing according to the word of God is wrong. That's confession. But repentance is turning away from that thing. So again, we are to tell people, man, the kingdom of God is near. And if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, because it's open to everybody. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, first thing you have to do is you have to repent. Repent of what? Whatever it is the word of God says is out of order. But not only just repentance but also believing, receiving. So those are two different things. Repentance is one thing. Believing is something else. You have a lot of people out there who say, yes, yes, I need to repent. I need to turn away from this. I need to turn away from that. I need to stop doing this. But yet they still won't receive Jesus. You and I probably know some people who are very, very good moral people. Have you met anybody like that? They're just good people. They don't cuss. They don't drink. They don't hang out with people who do. You know, they're just good people. I must confess, I wasn't one of them people. But there's some good moral people. And sometimes because they're so good and they're so moral, they don't think that they need Jesus. And so again, yes, yes, we get them, we ourselves again have to repent. I'm turning away from that. So that's one leg to get into the kingdom. But the other leg is to receive Jesus. So again, it was very, very important for Jesus to bring people into the kingdom. And so it should be for us. Now the third thing, that was important to Jesus and should be important to us is making disciples. See, helping to win souls to the kingdom and making disciples is, again, two different things. I get many times, again, we look at the word of God and we just take these terms and we throw them all together. But again, the third thing that was important to Jesus and should be important to us is making disciples. Listen to what Jesus said. In Matthew's gospel, 
In Matthew chapter 28, in verses 18 through 20, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey some things, teaching them to obey a few things. Now, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of people, including a lot of Christians, when they read that passage of Scripture, they think that's for professional Christians. That's for the professionals. That's for the pros. That's for the pastors. That's for the elders. That's for the deacons. And maybe a worship leader. That's for them. No. That's for all of us. If you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that passage of Scripture is to you. See, because also understand something. You have access to some people that I or the elders or the leadership in this church will never have access to. You have access to your physical brother and sister your cousin, mama and them. You got access to all of those people. And so what the Lord is saying to you is that you need to teach them. But you might be going, Pastor, teach them. I don't know nothing myself. How am I going to teach somebody else something? Here's the deal. If you have been coming to church, for six months. That means you have six months of something that somebody else doesn't have. If you've been coming for just six months, that means you have six months of teaching and preaching and wisdom being poured out on you that other people don't have. And here's the thing. The more you exercise and the more you use what you have, then you get an increase. It's kind of like bodily exercise. Sometimes people say, hey, well, you know, I, man, I'm just so tired. I'm just so weak. Well, you need to exercise. I'm too tired. I'm too weak to exercise. No, well, if you start, then watch to see if your body doesn't get stronger. And so, again, many times we go, oh, man, oh, man, I need to, you know, I need to teach people. I need to tell my brothers. I need to tell my sisters. I need to tell my coworkers. But I don't really know enough. Again, when you start exercising what you do have, watch and see if it doesn't grow. Here's the thing that you need to do. Here's the thing that we all need to do. We need to pray for boldness. We need to pray for boldness to use what we already have. I'm going to read a scripture to you that literally changed my life. As a young Christian, this scripture changed my life. This is also something that the early disciples of Jesus prayed to the Lord. You find this in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 29, the early disciples says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great Boldness. Again, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. When I first read that, it was revolutionary to me. It was like, wow, wait a minute. Hold up. These dudes who's praying this prayer had walked with Jesus. They had been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. These same dudes have been filled with the Holy Spirit. But here they are. They're praying, Lord, give us boldness. 
When I saw that, I'm like, wow. They walk with Jesus. They talk with Jesus. I mean, talking about being with the Lord. If they're praying for boldness, they mean, I need to start praying for boldness. So we, we need to be praying, Lord, give us boldness. Help us to use what you've already given us. One of the prayers, again, that we all should be praying, individually and collectively, is, Lord, give us boldness. Give us boldness. Lord, we just saw there that you want us to go out into all of the world and make disciples. Lord, give us boldness to do that. And Lord, hmm, and this is my confidence, you said, all power is in your hand, and you will never leave me. So when I go, I'm not going by myself. I'm not alone. I don't know about you, but especially in my early days as a Christian, have you ever begun to talk to somebody? You ever begin to witness to somebody about Christ? And man, scriptures and words that are coming out of your mouth and wisdom coming out of you that you didn't even know you had. You ever been there? I know the first few times it happened to me, I walked away like, wow, that was cool. Wow. Because as far as I was concerned, you know, I had like a one string banjo. Here it is, and I'm done. Right? And all of a sudden, I'm talking, and all of this stuff is spewing out. I'm just like, and you can feel the spirit moving. It's like, wow. He will do that. He is with us. So here's the thing. Over the last, again, month or so, we've been talking about a lot of different things. And I pray that you take these things and put them in your life. One of the main things that we challenged you with a couple of weeks ago was to establish a time and a place where you regularly meet with the Lord. How many of you have done that? So take a time and say, you know what? I think I read something today. It was a thing about Spurgeon. Sp well, yesterday, rather. Spurgeon says, man, I got a lot to do today. I got a lot of stuff on my plate. So I better spend the first three hours in prayer so I can get it done. I read that. I'm like, wow. Most of us going like, I got so much to do on my plate, I ain't got time to pray. No. No. And so I pray again that you have established that time when you say, this is me and the Lord's time, and nothing is coming in here. Be it early in the morning, be it your lunchtime, be it at night, shut it all down and go spend it with the Lord. And when you do that, you hear the voice of the Lord speaking. And as you follow the voice of the Lord, you'll see the power of the Lord, and then you'll know absolutely positively that he is with you always and all power is in his hands. Now, on that note, we're going to close out our time with a time of prayer. We're actually going to pray about everything that we have talked about today. And so we're going to ask a couple of people to come forward to lead us out in prayer. We're going to ask uh, Ms. Pam Brooks to uh, come forward. We're going to ask uh, Ms. Tirsa Vega to come forward. We're going to ask uh, Pastor Sean Osborne to come forward. And we're going to ask uh, Elder Chris Barr to come forward. They're going to lead, they're going to lead, come on, come on, come on up. They're going to lead us out in prayer about the very things again that we talked about today. Let uh, Pam have the mic first. Pam is going to lead us in prayer in regards to asking the Lord to help us to bring glory to his name. Guys, if you come on in a little more, I want not you guys come behind her. Come on. Let me get everybody in the camera shot. 
Come on here, Greg. Stand back up there. Up there. Bam. Go ahead, Pam. God, our Father, we thank you for just yet another opportunity, God, to come into your presence and help us as we've heard the series, Lord. Help us to passionately pursue you yes, so that your glory will manifest, God. Our desire, our heartfelt desire is to bring glory unto our Heavenly Father. But sometimes this flesh, Lord, sometimes this this, this flesh that we live in just gets in the way. Yes, you said, Lord God, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that we are your temple, that you will walk with us, you will be with us, God, but to separate ourselves, to move from amongst them. Yes, Lord. Help us to do that, God. Whatever is in our lives, Lord, help us to confess it so that we can bring forth the glory of the Lord. Help us to be the salt of this earth, God. You're dependent upon us, God. Just like your glory filled, Lord God, um, when the disciples were praying, Lord God, in the upper room, we want you to manifest in such a way where the world will see your glory. Yes. But you want to use us you want to use us as your vessels because we are your temple. So God, help us. Help us to lay bare before you. Help us to allow you to infiltrate those things in our lives that is keeping us from being who and what you want us to be. Lord, be glorified. Yes, Lord. Be glorified in and through us and help us to bring forth your glory. Help us to be instruments so that we can lead others to Christ and we can make disciples, Father. We don't have the power, but you do. Mm -hmm. And that power resides in us. So we humbly ask God to continue to work on us, continue to peel those things away and help us to be so desperate for you yes. that we allow you to do that inner work so that you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Cheers. Cheers is going to lead us out, asking the Lord to help us to win souls for the kingdom. Cheers. Oh, God, thank you for allowing us to just worship you, God. Thank you for allowing us to come here and just worship you, God. Lord, um, we have the key of something so wonderful that you've given us. However, sometimes we shy away of sharing to our neighbor, sharing to our coworkers, sharing to our friends in school, because we think we're gonna be made fun of or we don't wanna stick out. God, let us put our childish behind us and let us face the battle that's happening in America today. There's a lot of souls, Lord, to win. Yes, Lord. God, I pray for all of our hearts here today, from the little baby, Father, to the oldest person here, Father God, that you would shift in our hearts, Father God. Give us compassion for the lost. God, I pray that, um, Lord, that boldness within us would just rise up, Father, that we would see the desperation in people's hearts God, there's a shift in America right now, and they are, some of them are crying for you. They just don't even know that they're crying for you, God. God, you're unveiling hearts. You're unveiling eyes. I pray that we would step forward, God, that we would not shy away from your voice when you say, go and talk to your best friend. Go and talk to your neighbor. Go and talk to your father-in-law, to your mother-in-law, to your mother, to your sister. God, give us that boldness within us, God, that can only come for you. Lord, take captive every thought so that it may be obedient to you, Christ. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So I pray, Father, for each person that's in here, Father God. God, I pray for the young people, God, of our nation. God, they, they, they are coming in a world that it's, it's crazy. But it takes other younger people that are in this church to share the gospel. So I pray for every young person that is in here, Father God. I remember that, that the, the shyness of not wanting to be ridiculed or rejected, especially in high school, God. But I pray that you give them the fullness of fire within them, Father God. 
And I pray for all of us, Lord, as adults, that we would also share the gospel, God, and not keep it to ourselves. Pray for the one that needs it. In the name of Jesus, we just cry out to you, move our hearts, transform our hearts and our minds so that we can share to others. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I want to ask uh, Pastor Sean. He's going to be praying for, Lord, help us to make disciples. Oh, Father. I was up this morning praying about praying this morning in preparation for a time like this for a purpose so important, Father God. And as I was praying, Lord, it occurred to me through the Spirit that making disciples is an action word. It takes hands, it takes feet, it takes a sense of purpose. Yes, Lord. So, Father, Many of us have been exposed to many messages at this podium for many years, Lord. And we're in a position, a place, Father, where we have explained to ourselves why we either are or aren't acting upon making disciples. We've checked those boxes. We've made those explanations. We've felt ourselves better in the decisions that we've made, Father God. But Lord, we know that many of us are falling short in the using of those gifts, in the acquiring of the, the good news that we might dispense it's as simple as that, is expensing the good news. Letting others know there is hope, there is joy. Through this very sense of purpose, Father God, we find ourselves in this house this day. But for what other reason but this? For we have received ourselves. We have been the beneficiaries of a heavenly destination. We have been given the skills. We have been given the victory even. But having been given so much, we forget where we came from. We forget the hopelessness, the sorrow, the fear, the tears. Those that much of the world is experiencing today through this pandemic, through food lines, through the prospect of being evicted once the moratorium is released. These are the people that will be coming into these doors, Father God, that we must be ready to be that light, that salt, that hope, that joy. If it is not us, then who, Lord? So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Opportunity. Yes, Lord to be these hands, these feet, this mouthpiece, Father God, that we might bring in a multitude, Lord, and set the captives free. And we pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Elder Chris is gonna lead us in praying for boldness to do again what been called to do and literally equipped to do. Chris. Father God, we just want to thank you so much, Lord, that so many lessons we are available to us during this pandemic as we think about first responders and essential workers who we value so much, Lord, they have been equipped with a response plan, Lord. And Lord, now we have a vaccine. We thank you for that as they're receiving that to be able to go into the fire, to go into the places where no one else is qualified to go. Lord, you have commissioned us. You have equipped us with the truth, with the Holy Spirit, and most of all, with your love, Father. Father, we just pray that you will <laughs> vaccinate us against the pandemic of this world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the approval of man, the fear of man that often trips us up and causes us to snare and keeps us from 
performing our duties and Lord, like somebody who knows CPR, Lord, we're looking around, looking for someone else qualified. And you said, you go, yes, Lord. you tell your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your coworkers, Lord, as we don't want to be just reacting to things in the world, we just ask you to help us to lay hold of the response plan, Lord, and to prepare our hearts to seek you, Lord. We want to make people thirsty, but are we hungry and thirsty for you, Lord, as the deer pants for the water? We want to spread the love of God, but are we in love with you? Lord, you know our hearts. You, want, you know what needs to be corrected in us, Lord. So with that, Lord, we pray for the boldness to speak your word, not to be obnoxious or overbearing and uncaring but to say what you want us to say at the time and the place that you want us to say it the exact same way that Jesus would do it yes, Lord. move in us and through us Lord because we have been commissioned we've been equipped and we've been called so thank you Lord for making us bold and able to stand in this this dark and final hour, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we all stand, please?